So yes, I'm very glad to be um, with you today to present uh, this uh, theory that I am trying to develop. Um, let's go. Let me start with a kind of a silly example, but uh, doesn't works well for to introduce the belief desire theories of emotion. So obviously here the Blazers fan is uh, not very happy, he's perhaps uh, disappointed, while the um, Golden State Warriors fan is quite obviously happy. And how do we explain that? Well, an um, easy explanation is to say that uh, they both are witnessing the same game. Um, they both probably believe that Golden State has just scored important points, that they're gonna win the, the game. And one desires, the guy desires that they don't win the game while the girl desires that they do. So that explains why the guy is sad or disappointed and the girl is happy. Very common sense kind of explanation of uh, how uh, emotions um, can be elicited. Now, here are the take home messages of this talk. Um, first, um, although belief desire series of emotions, oh, I have just to move this, this bar here. <laughs> Although they have faced many objections in the past, a new version seems to uh, avoid these objections. Oops. I call this version the etiological cognition cognition account for reasons that I, I will explain uh, in a moment. And this uh, should uh, uh, come as good news because BDT promise uh, to uh, many theoretical advantages. I'm just gonna start a chronometer check. Voilà. So the plan of the talk is uh, in three parts. First, I'm gonna introduce the belief th desire theories of emotion in general. Then I'll present the new BDT that uh, I talked about, the etiological cognition, cognition account or the ECA. Then I'll present objections to the BDTE, to the belief desire theories of emotion and how the ECA can answer these objections. Okay, so let's go on with the first part of the talk. So one way to introduce uh, the belief desire theories of emotion a bit uh, further than I did with the uh, basketball fans picture is to present the theory uh, proposed by O.H. Green in 1992. He says that basically we can analyze an emotion like likeness as such. The subject believes with certainty that P, that for instance, that uh, he has won $10,000 or 10,000 euros or rather, and he desires that uh, to, want to win uh, 10,000 euros. Sarah would be a bully, uh, that when the subject believes with certainty that P and desires that not P, fear would be when A believes without certainty that P and A desires that P. And hope would be A believes without certainty that P and desires that not P. Okay, so I don't think this theory is gonna work, but uh, it shows in what direction belief desire theories can go and gives a taste of some advantages that uh, belief desire theories can have. So in philosophy, such theories have been proposed by quite many philosophers, especially in the eighties, um, but also in the beginning of the 20th century by Meinong. In psychology, more recently, uh, belief desire theories have been proposed. And these theories can be of different for, sorts. So for instance, Marx or Green uh, propose reductive theories where uh, they want to reduce emotions to a, a set of belief and desire pairs. Some like Searle say that the belief desire pairs in questions are a necessary precondition for the emotions. And some other like uh, Robert Gordon claim that they play a causal role in the emotional episode. And I'm gonna argue that uh, I favor the later kind of view. So it's really a family of theories, this, these belief desire theories of emotion uh, or perhaps a research program and its core commitment would be that we can characterize, analyze, and better and better understand emotions through belief desire pairs. 
Now, the belief these are theories of emotion make uh, quite a lot of promises, and they are promises. And for instance, they promise to give a causal explanation of emotional elicitation. They, pr they promise to explain why certain emotions are caused at certain point in time in certain people, given their beliefs and desires. They promise also to explain, to give some intelligibility, intelligibility of to emotional reactions that may not be intelligible in the first place. So for instance, you don't understand why somebody is fearful or you don't understand why somebody is happy. And the BDT would tell you, well, it's because this person has such set of belief, has such set of belief and desires. It also promises to give various normative conditions for emotions that are quite uh, straightforward. So for instance, they may say that emotions are justified uh, if and only if the beliefs, the relevant beliefs are justified. So for instance, uh, Mary, Maria, uh, Maria's happiness is justified if and only if it is true that she really won 10,000 euros or if her belief rather that she won 10,000 euros is justified, sorry. Emotions are conatively virtuous, uh, if and only if the desires are virtuous. So for instance, if um, somebody is happy to have become, a, uh, no, is a, <laughs> It's, sorry, hopes to become a vampire. Uh, the belief um, may be unjustified that there is a possibility to become a, a desire. But then the question is, what about the desire? Is it cognitively virtuous? Is it a good thing to want to become a, a desire? Um, if so, this uh, uh, emotion of hope, since um, I assume involves something like a desire to become a vampire would be uh, cognitively virtuous. And then emotions can be said to be appropriate if uh, and only if the beliefs and the, are true, the, the relevant beliefs are true and the desires are virtuous. Uh, another promise of the BDT is that it may allow to build bridges with important theories within and outside uh, philosophy. Mm. So for instance, there are many philosophical explanations in terms of uh, beliefs for action, for reasoning, for our moral judgments and more. And accounting for emotional episodes, for emotions through beliefs, allow bridging these kinds of explanations with um, emotion theory, basically. And the same can be said outside uh, philosophy, for instance, in rational choice theory or reinforcement learning, because these two kinds of theories uh, use concepts that are, if not beliefs and desires, at least very similar and perhaps translatable in talks of beliefs and desires. So rational choice theory talks about expected utility and preferences, and these may translate into belief desire talks. And if so, we may have a bridge between rational choice theory and emotion theory that is not available uh, to other theories. Um, and it's very interesting because from what I saw, I'm not an expert at all on this topic, but from what I saw in rational, rational, rational choice theory, emotions have been theorized in ways that I wouldn't you know, um, defend. And especially they, they've been seen as this irrational um, burst uh, that I don't think they are. In formal semantics also, we have accounts of beliefs and desire descriptions that are well developed. And if so, we can wonder, maybe can we develop a theory of emotional terms that uh, use beliefs and desires if a BDTE are correct, um, so that we can analyze uh, an expression like yuck in terms of belief and desires, and so analyze it through the formalizations of belief and desire ascriptions that have been put forward in formal semantics. That's a thread that would be interesting to follow if the BDTE are um, successful. 
Okay, so that was the introduction. Now let me go on with um, the, the, the account that I proposed. But first I need to introduce a term, which is the appraisal process. I mean, an expression that is the appraisal process, which I used as do many psychologists uh, from different um, uh, theoretical strands. Um, um, Matsumoto and Ekman, Sander Grandjean and Scherer, Ortony and Clore or Morse, all use uh, the, the expression, the appraisal process as I will use it, although they come from different, uh, psycho uh, from different psychological, I mean, sorry, from different theoretical background in psychology. Okay, so the appraisal process was uh, hypothesized, was postulated, in order to explain a quite straightforward uh, phenomenon, which is uh, the fact that kinds of sti stimuli are not uh, in a one-to-one -one relation with kinds of emotional responses to these uh, stimuli. So uh, for instance, someone may be afraid that there is a mouse in the kitchen, while another person may be angry that there is a mouse in the kitchen, Similarly, on the, other, on the other side of the coin, some people may undergo admirative, uh, uh, may, may undergo aesthetic admiration toward a rose, and another person, person may, may, go, may undergo the, the same kind of emotion toward a totally different kind of uh, stimuli, for instance, a, 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 the totally different kind of stimulus, for instance, a, a dance, okay? So no one-to-one -one relation between emo kinds of emotions and kinds of stimuli. So, uh, the appraisal process is, is uh, this intermediary representation or at least mental process that um, explains why, um, for instance, a person may be afraid of the mouse. She, the idea would be that she appraises it as somehow dangerous, perhaps because she believes that mice carry a certain kind of dangerous disease or can crawl up under your clothes and hurt you or something. Um, the other person may consider that the, the mouse is a, a slight. I mean, the, the fact that the mouse is in her kitchen is kind of a slight and, and she, she, she needs to, 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 to kick out the mouse. And that, that's why she, she, she appraises it in a way, she appraises it in a way that causes her anger. And the two people undergoing aesthetic admiration may apprehend or appraise um, the two different kinds of stimuli um, as, um, say, fascinatingly beautiful or something of that sort. So that's the idea. Now, the ECA, the etiological cognition, cognition account say, says the, the following. It first says that the appraisal process is describable in terms of belief and desire pairs. In, in fact, in three pairs of belief and desire. I will come, that to, come back to that. And these BD pairs constitute a partial causal explanation, hence the name etiological, uh, the noun etiological, of the other emotional components, which are the emotional action tendencies. So for instance, tendency to aggress in anger or to flee or freeze in um, uh, fright. The, the emotional physiological changes, um, the dilatation of the pupils, the uh, muscle contractions, and the emotional feelings. So there are four parts uh, to emotions according to the theory that I present. The appraisal process, which is just a set of BD pairs um, put together in a certain kind of inferential um, 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 process, let's say. The action tendencies, the physiological changes, and the emotional feelings. And the, the BD pairs cause the, partially cause the, the three other components of the emotional episode. These BD pairs can be unconscious, low level, and fragmented. I will come back to, to this. Thus, demonic views of uh, beliefs and uh, desires, uh, perhaps those of, of Davidson or McDowell or Searle, especially their views of desires, uh, sorry, of beliefs, may prefer to call uh, these um, mental states 
cognition cognition pairs instead of belief desire uh, pairs. Uh, in this talk, I'm not going to talk of cognition cognition pairs, but of belief desire pairs. But I, uh, I, I, I let open the possibility that uh, we, we talk of cognition cognition pairs instead of belief desire pairs in, in the future, perhaps. So that's why the account uh, uses this, this uh, expression. Uh, now, some recent uh, coxi influence theories would count uh, the, the, the relevant methodologies as proper uh, belief desire pairs, and I will follow them here. And in particular, uh, the ACA fits well with uh, Eric Mendelbaum's uh, account of belief. Uh, hi, uh, Eric, I saw you were here. Uh, yes, still here. Great. <laughs> and uh, uh, Tim Schroeder's account of desires. But other accounts could, could made, be made to work as well. But I think the ACA fits particularly well with this two, these two accounts. OK. Now, the ACA is in, in, inspired by Robert Gordon's work, in particular, his analysis of fear, and in particular, the fact that he um, proposes that fear is caused by three sets of wish or desire uh, belief pairs. I'm not going to go through this scheme, but uh, just to say. And it's also very much inspired by Agnes Moore's integrated theory of emotional behavior. Let me now say more about the three um, belief desire pairs that I think um, cause the other emotional components. So the three belief desire pairs to which the appraisal process are, is reduced. The first is about goal relevance. Um, it's constituted by a prior desire that P and a newly acquired belief that either P or not P. So for instance, uh, well, I'm not gonna give you examples now, so, so yeah, just in the abstract, uh, prior desire that P and a new uh, belief that P or not P. Now, the belief and the desire can have different strengths in different circumstances, and the strength of the desire may uh, be determined by its position in a goal hierarchy, as well as its salience or uh, accessibility. That is, you have a certain hierarchy of goals. Um, so, for instance, the goal to survive is very high in your hierarchy of goals, and the desire to survive is very strong because uh, the gold survive is very high. Um, okay. The desire to eat uh, a banana is much lower. Um, uh, and so, uh, uh, sorry, the goal to eat a banana is much lower. And so the desire to eat a banana is, is less strong. Um, uh, paribus. The salience is uh, whether you have a, an access that is um, very easy to um, a desire or not, depending on the context. And the strength of the beliefs may be determined by uh, their subjective probability, how, how much you, you, you would be ready to, to, to bet, for instance, uh, uh, concerning the proposition in question, <laughs> and whether uh, the, this uh, proposition in question is accessible or not, is, whether the, the belief uh, in the proposition is accessible or not, once again, it depends on situations, on the on how your your mind is um, at a certain point in time, if you're tired or not, etc. Now, stimuli of various kinds can cause the new belief, and these stimuli can also cause auxiliary beliefs um, about, about related topics. I'll come back to that. Let me also mention that uh, the stim stimuli can be of various kinds. So you, you, it can be a memory that elicits this new belief, or it can be an episode of imagination, or it can be uh, a sensation, a perception, or an inference. And these uh, processes may also cause auxiliary be beliefs that are related uh, to uh, the, the initial uh, belief in one. Okay. Second pair is about goal congruence. Um, the second pair is constituted by a belief that step one is congruent or incongruent depending on um, whether 
it is a belief that P or a belief that not P, together with a desire to maintain the congruence or to reduce uh, the incongruence. The strength of this congruence of this, or, or of this incongruence depends on the strength of the desires and the of the desire and the beliefs in one. So if you have a strong desire that P and a strong desire, a uh, strong belief that P, you have a strong uh, congruence um, and this uh, and it does a, a strong potentially a strong desire to maintain his congruence. These congruence and incongruence uh, will cause or may cause positive and negative feelings and will also activate the reward uh, system. Um, okay. Perhaps the congruence or the incongruence is not strong enough and so it won't cause a, a noticeable a positive or negative feeling. Um, and third and last, uh, uh, BD pair is about the action repertoire and the action tendency. Um, you have a belief that doing A now is the best way to maintain the concurrence or to reduce the incongruence, and thus you come up with the desire uh, to do A. Uh, the, 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 the action A comes from your behavior or mental action repertoire. And the more urgent uh, the maintenance of the congruence or the reduction of the incongruence, the, the more prioritized uh, the action is gonna be. So you may stop everything else uh, to do that. This desire uh, to do A um, will, our intention to do A perhaps in the end, um, Will, call, will cause bodily and motivational uh, feelings uh, eventually, uh, if they are strong enough, uh, the, the, the bodily and motivational components, if they are strongly influenced, you will feel your body you know, changed, <laughs> prepared for instance to run or to attack, and you will feel uh, these motivational uh, components as well. Okay, so all of this happens in an extremely short period of time. It's before the emotion is elicited. So it may sound incredible to that we have all this uh, belief and desire uh, happening uh, quite instantly, but I think it's not so unreasonable to, to, to think that it's, our mind is quite uh, striking, right? Uh, and so we can re uh, summarize these three steps as I did in the little vignette uh, up, up here on the right. Okay. Now, let me give an example with the elicitation of a typical anger episode. So Maria strongly desires that she's respected, that's P. And in response to an insult by Sam, she believes with certainty that she's not respected, not P. She forms the auxiliary beliefs that Sam made it so that not be intentionally and that he or other agents may recidivate. Maria believes that there is a strong incongruence between her belief and her desire in one. This will cause negative feelings. She comes to strongly urgently reduce this incongruence and this will motivate her to act. Maria believes that among her action repertoire, repertoire, aggressing the offender, aggressing Sam, is the best way to reduce the incongruence in two. And it may raise the probability that she will be respected in the future since Sam and the audience should recognize that she won't tolerate any such disrespect and that she's ready to make the offenders pay the price of their offense. For this reason, she does comes to desire to aggress Sam, which will be the main action tendency of this anger episode. Okay, yeah, one, as, uh, as Filippo said, uh, if you have any clarif clarificatory questions at any point in time, don't hesitate. Okay, 
Now let me talk about some of the features of the belief and desires postulated by uh, this account. They are unconscious by default because they arise very early in the process and they may reach consciousness or not. Some beliefs, uh, some desires may always reach uh, consciousness in a given emotional episode. So for instance, in delight, it seems that we have beliefs that reach consciousness in any case. So for instance, I'm delighted that Truman was elected, though I don't know whether he was or not. Sounds strange, very strange, right? Because it seems when you are delighted that P, you have a conscious belief that P. Uh, but some other beliefs or desires may not reach consciousness. And in fact, may, perhaps there are cases of unconscious delight where you don't have a conscious access to uh, the beliefs. So I'm, I leave that open. Um, these beliefs and desires can be fragmented. And here I um, follow in particular the work of Eric. Uh, and here's a quote from uh, a paper by uh, and Mendelbaum about implicit beliefs. So just, sorry, before I, I read the quote, let, let me briefly introduce this idea of fragment, fragmentation. The idea is that uh, we can have belief, at least belief fragments, perhaps deserve fragments as well, but at least we can have belief fragments. That is, we have different parts or different places in our mind that are not so well connected and that explain why we may have two contradictory beliefs at a certain point in time without being completely irrational, without being completely crazy. It's just that these two fragments of our minds are not connected at this point in time. And implicit biases, implicit beliefs may be, I think, convincingly uh, analyzed as being fragmented in the sense that you have an implicit belief that is in a certain fragment, and that may be in contradiction with an explicit belief that you have. And hence, you don't know that you have this implicit belief and you uh, think that you don't have it. So for instance, the implicit racist may store racist and egalitarian beliefs in distinct fragments, and only the egalitarian belief fragment is accessed for conscious planning and speech behavior. That's why the, the, the implicit racist would say, I'm not racist. Um, while the racist belief fragment is accessed in low level behaviors, such as crossing the street uh, to avoid someone of a different race, or also in um, implicit association tasks, uh, which is another kind of low level behavior that would reveal the racist belief fragment. Okay, so the belief and desires that I uh, talk about in the ECA can be fragmented. They can be low level and unsophisticated. They can be present in infants and non-human animals, for instance. So Carothers goes as far as saying that bees really do exemplify the belief desire architecture. Uh, other people, other philosophers agree with him. Fodor talks of uh, the belief and desires of, uh, of his cats, Dretzky uh, of birds. And yes, I think there are quite many ways to account for beliefs and desires in a way that is not demanding, that doesn't require them to be sophisticated. Once again, it's all of the, all, uh, all of the steps, that the steps one, two, three uh, here, they happen very fast uh, according to the measures uh, of the appraisal process by Long to Hess and Conchonchero, they last, the, the episode is below uh, 0 0.2 uh, seconds. So extremely, very fast. I mean, yeah. There may be innate or conditioned associations between certain of the beliefs and certain stimu stimuli which result in reflex-like responses. So for instance, it may be the case that we have an innate tendency to believe that we are in danger when we hear a loud, sudden uh, bang. Uh, this is uh, something that, I mean, we, we noticed that main, many uh, species, species um, have a startled reflex when they hear such loud noises. And this may be due to an innate belief that uh, 
we are in danger when we hear uh, this kind of noise. Similarly, we may be conditioned to, for instance, cladicial conditioning to associate a certain stimulus with a certain kind of belief. That's entirely possible. And this may lead to reflex-like uh, emotional uh, responses. Furthermore, beliefs may be biased by feedback responses, notably feedback responses from physiological changes. So for instance, uh, if you inject um, adrenaline to somebody, this person may be ready to interpret a, a behavior as aggressive that she wouldn't otherwise interpret as aggressive. So our, our beliefs may be biased by these feedback responses. Why? Because um, we are used perhaps when our body is aroused in a certain way to have certain kinds of beliefs and perhaps this association between the feedback, between the physiological responses and certain kind of beliefs may create, um, you know, an association that prime certain beliefs or that bias our beliefs so that there is an influence from the body to the mind in, in such cases that may not be reasonable. Okay. So we can summarize the, the whole picture that I've offered until now with this diagram. So basically you have uh, the, the, the emotion episode is represented by these four um, rectangles. And prior to that, you have a goal hierarchy that determines your desires. Um, you have a, a new perception, memory, inference, imagination, or another kind of episode that changes the belief in one. You have this kind of inferential process happening here. This causes um, action tendency. Well, you come up with a desire to, to act in a certain way. This may cause an intention to act or some other form of process that uh, leads you to have a certain action tendency, which in turn causes physiological uh, responses that may also be uh, linked with uh, your beliefs and desires, as well as, and all of these together cause the emotional uh, feeling. So the emotional feeling um, involve perhaps belief and desires components, as well as your body, uh, body response and uh, your motivation action tendencies. And the three components here may feedback into the belief and desires and change the emotional episode or prolong it. Um, and yeah. All right. I hope it's clear. Can I can I just interrupt you just one second? Yes. So I don't. Um, um, I'm, I'm. I think this is clarifying. So why why do you have uh, partial feedback effects are partially causative as well, right? Yes, so, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, it's just that. Um, I yes, I put feedback effects in a different uh, a row. Although of course there are partial causations as well, it's just because um, they um, happen later than the first arose. Um, so it was to represent a bit the time discrepancy uh, between, for instance, this arrow here and this arrow here, um, or this arrow here and this arrow here. But yes, it's totally partial causation as well. <laughs> Okay, so in sum, the ECA does not aim to reduce emotions to BD pairs, only the appraisal process. The ECA postulates three BD pairs, and the ECA postulates BD pairs that can be unconscious, fragmented, and unsophisticated. And these three features, I think, are the features that were lacking to previous uh, belief desire theories. Um, the conjunction of these three features is what were, was lacking in previous brief desire series, which didn't allow them to respond to the objections that they have faced. But I think, I hope, uh, the ECA can uh, answer to these objections because of these three features. So now let's see this. 
So there are three types of objections. One is about uh, beliefs, another one is about desires, and the third is about the two. So the first type of objection is that beliefs are not necessary for normally elicited emotions, contrary to what BDTE in general uh, uh, postulates, and the DEK in particular. So why would one uh, hold uh, this objection? A first reason is uh, the infants and non-human emotions. So it has been argued that infants and non-human animals don't have the cognitive capacity to entertain the relevant beliefs, but they can undergo emotions. So uh, beliefs are not necessary to undergo emotions and the belief desire accounts are, uh, fail. The answer you may expect it is that the kind of beliefs posited by the ECA is, are not too demanding for non-human animals, neither, uh, and, and, and neither for infants. This is compatible with Menopel's accounts of uh, beliefs, for instance, but also with many other kinds of, of, of accounts, for instance, Dennett, Kretzky's, Fodor, or Schwitz cables. Uh, they all, I think, uh, allow for beliefs that can be, uh, the re for, for, for the relevant beliefs to, to be available to uh, infants and human animals. Constant. Okay. Yes. Can I, can I stop you for a second? Because we yes. have a, yeah, there is a clarifying question yes. from Dilara Boga. Uh, do you want to ask the question or do you want me to ask? Uh, I think you can ask. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so she wants to know, can emotions also cause beliefs or desires? Because it seems like beliefs and desires are playing fundamental roles in goal hierarchy, but not the emotions. Um, so yes, I, I think uh, emotions make so emotions, there are these, according to the theory, these four components. So the, the beliefs and desires, these may cause further beliefs and desires. Uh, the uh, uh, physiological responses, the action tendency and the emotional feelings. And yes, all of those I think can cause further beliefs and further uh, desires. I'll talk about uh, uh, kind of desire that, that uh, happen after the emotion is elicited that is caused by the emotion uh, episodes somehow. Um, concerning goal hierarchies, can emotional episodes change goal hierarchies? Uh, I don't have a strong opinion on this view. It's, um, I guess that like the further up you go in the goal hierarchy, the more stable it is. Um, so for instance, you, you may have certain goals that are just um, means to end goals. Um, and, and these can be easily changed and notably by emotional episodes. Uh, but for, for high, uh, um, for, for the goal to survive, for instance, can the goal to survive be changed by an emotional episode? I'm not sure. Um, I, I don't know, to be honest. It's a very interesting uh, subject I find. How can goals and desires be changed uh, yeah well, yeah thank you because i was actually maybe if i add like a small uh, comment or follow-up because i am working on artificial intelligence and when people talk about the the concept of agency and goals for ai they seem to think that emotions are sometimes like this side effects almost but when they kind of search more further they also care about emotions in the sense of maybe even for the goal of survival, if you have a super negative emotion, then many agents, at least many moral agents, end up, for example, deciding to commit suicide, right? So it seems like emotion even influencing this goal to survive in this sense. So, but yeah, thank you. Okay, well, so in this case, it's not uh, clear enough whether it's the emotional episodes that cause the will to commit suicide, or whether it's the antecedent beliefs and desires that cause both an emotion and the will to uh, commit suicide. I see. So the two options are open at, at this stage of description, I think. Um, one other thing that I may say about this topic is that I've talked about the reward system. So um, the congruence or the incongruence may yield uh, rewards or punishments in, 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 at the neural level um, in the neural mm -hmm. system. And these may reinforce or uh, um, not uh, certain 
beliefs or desires uh, for sure uh, yeah, yeah thank you yes you're welcome okay let's continue Doo -doo -doo. So uh, second reason to hold that uh, beliefs may not be necessary for certain emotional episodes are uh, the existence is the existence of recalcitrant emotions. So recalcitrant emotions are, for instance, uh, the, typically you believe that a certain spider, a daddy long leg is not dangerous, yet you fear it. Um, so you have uh, an emotion that seems to be in tension with um, your, your, your beliefs. And according to versions of the BDT, it would be really a contradiction. And beliefs are central cognitive mechanisms which are supposed to access all information from perception, judgments, imagination, etc. However, one can undergo recalcitrant emotions that are in contradiction with one's beliefs. Uh, yeah. So there's a problem here for uh, the belief desires theory of emotion. How can you have an emotion? of fear, which presupposes something like at least a uh, belief that what you're afraid of is dangerous, according to BDTE. And at the same time, have the belief that this daddy long leg is totally unharm, it's harmless. The answer uh, would be, uh, would come in two parts. First, the EKA allows for beliefs to be fragmented. And so to a certain degree, be insensitive to evidence. So you may have the belief that the spider is harmful in one fragment of your mind. And then perhaps, despite what you would like to admit to yourself, you also hold the belief that the spider is maybe dangerous. Maybe it's nasty. Despite what your, your, your parents have told you, even though you trust your friends and your parents who have told you that daddy long legs are totally harmless, you may still have this belief somewhere in your mind, especially because it seems that we have an innate tendency to um, be afraid of spiders. So perhaps we have an innate tendency to believe that things that look like spiders are dangerous. That's not crazy, I think. Second, there may be innate and conditioned associations between stimuli and beliefs. So I've already introduced this idea with the, the, uh, the, the thought that, um, the belief that spiders are dangerous may be innate. And there are studies that seem to go in this direction. Okay. Third reason to think that beliefs are necessary is uh, the existence of irrational and irrational actions. And this is probably the more problematic, um, uh, the, the, what is most uh, difficult for the BDTE to, to deal with. Some actions done in the grip of an emotion are just not rational enough to be accounted for by the belief part of the BD account, the objection goes. This has been uh, developed by Hershaus, Dylan Seedering, Scarantino Nielsen, and uh, many other people. And the short answer to this is that our beliefs often fail to be as rational as we, as we would like them to, to be. But I have also a long answer. And the long answer um, distinguishes four cases of irrational and irrational actions due to emotion. The first kind of cases are what I would call displaced or symbolic actions. And the typical examples given by Hershaus is uh, the, the, the case where a, a person gorgeous holes in someone's picture, in the picture of her enemy, she pierces or her, he pierces the eyes of uh, the enemy instead, oh, sorry, of the, the photograph of the enemy instead of the real enemy's eyes. The other quite sad example given by Horst Harris is a, a, a guy who rolls around in one's dead wife's clothes um, instead of rolling around with, with, with his dead wife uh, in, in their bed, uh, I guess. So that's why it's symbolic or displaced. The so second kind is uh, the, the inconsistent actions. So for instance, drinking more than one bullies one should out of an urge to drink or not going to the dentist um, out of fear, despite the, the beliefs that those, were, those are not the things to do. You should go to the dentist and not drink more. Third, third kind are post-functional actions. 
So for there's this story of uh, the, the, the guy who has his daughter attacked by a rabbit dog and the guy shoots the dog and sh keeps shooting the dog after the dog is long dead. Another case also involving a dog, Delancy, uh, dogophobic person, it seems, <laughs> uh, who talks about a guy who escapes, uh, who, who, a dog who, uh, that runs away uh, after him. He enters his house, locks the door, uh, go up his uh, room, uh, locks the door of his room. Um, yeah, so it's post-functional. It's uh, too much. It, it goes way further uh, what would be reasonable to do, it seems. And finally, expressive actions such as jumping out of joy or rumpling someone's hair were given as examples uh, by her house of actions that uh, can be explained only by emotions and not, and not by belief and desire pairs. So the displaced and symbolic actions together with the inconsistent actions may well be, uh, according to Eka, uh, given the subject's bounded perspective, appraised as the best way to reduce some incongruence. That's what, that's how the ECA would deal with cases A and B. So for instance, the person uh, with, with the picture, she desires to really harm her uh, enemy, um, but she, 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 she may even desire to really pierce the eyes of her enemy, but she, she cannot do that. She believes she cannot do that for legal reasons, for instance. Um, and this creates an incongruence uh, in her, uh, these two conflicting belief and desire, which she wants to reduce. And now the best thing to do perhaps for her would be to make believe that uh, she really hurts her enemy. And that's why she uses the photograph and pierce the eyes of her, her enemy in the photograph. Um, she believes unconsciously in a very error prone and fast automatic kind of way. She forms the belief that this is the thing to do to reduce the incongruence. Um, it may not be the best thing to do. She may do other acts that would be more efficient, but that's what uh, she comes up with from her bounded perspective. Same uh, with the guy drinking. Um, he, there is a strong incongruence between his uh, desire to drink one more glass and his belief that uh, he can't because, of, uh, because he must drive or whatever. But then he decides that uh, after all, perhaps uh, the best thing to do is to reduce this uh, incongruence with another glass of uh, wine. Um, yeah, not gonna go into details here, but I think we can give a very sophisticated explanations of such cases that are not, uh, uh, crazy, but uh, pretty convincing. Post-functional actions may be explained by the desire to avoid risks at the cost of overreacting. So the guy who shoots the dogs many more times than it necessary uh, may uh, have formed the belief um, you know, in this very early stage uh, of uh, his response um, that it's better to keep shooting uh, the dog, although probably the dog is dead. It's better to avoid the risk that the dog is not dead. Uh, but they may also be explained by the inertia of affective states, which are potentially caused by feedback effects from physiological changes. What I mean by that is that um, the affective state causes uh, all those physiological changes, this arousing uh, of the body. And when one is aroused, one usually is in cer certain kinds of situations. So if one is arose in a certain way, maybe one is uh, in a, often one is in a dangerous situation. And so the signals coming from the body bias the beliefs toward thinking that we are still in danger. And this is why perhaps there's an inertia in the affective state, uh, which um, delay the reaction and explain why post-functional actions are, common, or are, are more common in emotional episodes than in non-emotional episodes because of feedback effects. Finally, expressive actions may be explained by uh, communicative desires. Um, you want to, 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 to communicate your joy because you think uh, that this is a good way to maintain the congruence 
um, that uh, that cause the joys. And but sometimes you do it if you're when you're alone. And this doesn't help you to <laughs> in any way. But uh, it would be comparable to the fact that we speak with our hands when we're on the phone and we have all these communicative habits that we do when we are alone um, that don't make sense, but that are not special to emotions and that perhaps are more costly to repress than to um, let go. Uh, okay, so time flies. Um, I'm sorry if I'm, yeah. I may not uh, go through all the objections to have uh, more, enough time to, to discuss for discussion. Especially this one um, is uh, an emotion that has been given. These others are connectively too sophisticated, but you already know what I'm going to say. Uh, we don't need to have a cognitively sophisticated account of desires, uh, especially uh, if you think that re 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 desires are linked to reward systems. Um, so, yeah. Another kind of obje objection is the wrong direction uh, of fit objection. Um, so, for instance, the Anthony says that one important intuitive difference between emotions and desires lies in the fact that the latter have the world to mind direction of fit. And Goldie says, if emotions implies both direction of fit, then there cannot be emotions which don't lead to a motivation to act, but there can be cases like that. And what I want to say about those is that Dieke maintains that emotions have both directions of fit. There is an indicative and an imperative function to the emotions, which come from their beliefs and their desires. Um, so I'm not denying that they have a, a, the, the, the world to my direction of fit uh, here, but and furthermore, we can say that there can be emotions we don't lead to motivation to act because the overall action tendency is determined by many factors. Okay. Finally, um, for um, desires, uh, desires may be caused by uh, emotions, some say. So uh, it's not true that desires cause emotion. They come after the emotions, they don't come before. I desire to hit Jack because I'm angry with him and I desire to flee from the dog because I'm afraid, not vice versa. The answer that I would give is that we should distinguish two aspects of desires involved in emotions, either two kinds of desires, two different desires, or an evolution from one desire to an, um, from an evolution from one moment in a desire to another moment in the same desire, perhaps. Uh, so the conscious phenomenologically hot desire to hit Jack and to flee from the dog come after the emotion elicitation process. I'm denying that, that's for sure. But the desire postulated by the ECA are antecedent. They cause the action tendencies, the flight, the aggression. They cause the physio physiological arousal. And all of those together cause, uh, partially cause the hot phenomenology. So the idea is that um, the hot phenomenology is in the emotional feeling. So the desire to hit Jack that you really, you feel like you really want to hit Jack like this. This is part of the emotional uh, feeling. And this is not only caused by the, the beliefs uh, from the BD, uh, and desires from the BD pairs here, but also from the action tendency and the phys physiological uh, responses. Uh, so the hotness of this desire is influenced by uh, these two components together with the first. Um, that's how I would explain that we think that the hot desires are caused by the emotions is because the hot phenomenology comes after indeed uh, th this, uh, this, these three uh, things um, and, and may last for a long time. While these are extremely fast, unconscious by default may not, yeah. So. Okay, last types of objection. Uh, BD pairs are sufficiently explanatory. So for instance, emotions phenomenology cannot be explained by, by a BD pair according to some. Compare a person who is afraid of X with one who merely believes that X is dangerous and desires not to be in a dangerous situation. They don't have the same kind of a, a phenomenology. So uh, emotions cannot be uh, explained by BDTE. 
The answer is perhaps obvious by now. The phenomenology of an emotional uh, episode is not only caused by the BD curves, but also by modifications in action tendency and physiological changes. If the latter don't take place, if you don't have a action tendency and physiological changes, uh, if you don't have these modifications, uh, typical of emotions, then it's not a full emotional episode. And it's, that's why it's, uh, that the phenomenology is different. If you merely have a, a, a belief that X is dangerous and a desire not to be in a dangerous situation, but you don't have the physiological changes in action tendency, typical of emotions, of course, the phenomenology is gonna be different. Um, but the kind of phenology highlighted by many people such as Deona and Terroni is entirely compatible with the Eka. So they say, for instance, that in fear, we feel the way our body is poised, those are the physiological changes, to act in a way that will contribute to the neutralization of what provokes the fear, that's the action tendency, and it's explained by the Eka. In anger, we feel the way our body is prepared, uh, at physiological change, for active hostility to whatever causes the anger. Action tendency. Okay, I'm not going to go through the last objection because it's very similar to the previous one, um, and also it's a lot of text. It, although it was a fun example, I'm going to just keep it to go to the conclusion. Um, so, can the ECA fulfill all that BDTE promise? Um, so, it's a lot of open questions. So for causal explanation of emotional hesitation, yes, it seems that we have an account. For the integrity of emotional reactions, yes, it seems we do too, though uh, sometimes it is more fruit-like kind of uh, intelligibility than uh, the old BDT would allow because we talk about unconscious beliefs, unconscious desires sometimes. Then the various normative uh, conditions, um, it, it's all, you know, all, all of those need more work. So uh, can we talk uh, of uh, emotions being justified just if the bees are justified? It, does that work only for conscious beliefs? Can you have uh, an emotion that is justified by unconscious belief? I don't know. Same with uh, the other cases. So the cognitively virtuous emotions, the appropriate emotions, we, we have to see basically at this point. Same again with the bridges with important theories. So rational choice theory, um, can, it, can it work with the, the account I've given? Yes, but probably you'd have to give up things like transity of preferences or perfect information because, uh, because the account postulates its fragments. So yes, reinforcement learning, I've briefly mentioned it. Uh, seems like we can build a bridge potentially. And with formal semantics, that's something I find very interesting. If the Eka is correct, what this emoticon or what Yuck expresses is a complex event that includes three BD pairs of the speaker. So could, could these BD pairs be part of their semantics, the semantics of these uh, expressions? That's an interesting question I find. Okay. So in sum, the many objections uh, faced by the BDT have not been fatal, I have argued. The ECA uh, seems to be uh, able to avoid them because it only aims to, to reduce sorry, the, the appraisal process to the BD pairs. It postulates three BD pairs instead of just one, as in most uh, uh, old BDT. And it allows uh, them to be unconscious, fragmented, and unsophisticated. At least the ECA indicates a possible direction for new BDT. It's not perfect I, for sure, but I, I hope that we can go in this direction and potentially build the bridges that I've been talking about um, briefly. So don't hesitate to contact me if you have any question or if you want a draft uh, version of the paper. <laughs>